slide's not advancing. Okay, so I've got no relevant disclosures, um, and hopefully we'll be involved in this clinical trial looking at annual closure devices at Cedars. Um, it's a fascinating topic. I've seen in my career two other uh, annular closure devices that were really based on the annulus. And I think uh, I want to present something to you today that's not based on the annulus and may have a, a different way of preventing recurrent herniations. So Kerrigy has shown us that those with full annular defects have a high chance of recurrence. If I ask the audience, like how many people would say their recurrent disc herniation rate is greater than 10 percent? Wow, honest people, two people out there. How many believe that it's less than 10 percent? Less than 5 percent? TK, he's the only guy. It's 10, okay. Well, it, it, it's a jaded question because it really depends on the annular defect size, and that's been shown. And if you look at um, Kerrigy's work, those with the biggest annular defect have the highest risk. Also, if you just look across disc herniations, it looks like about a third of your patients would qualify. So about a third of your disc herniation patients most likely have a full annular defect and are at a higher risk of reherniation. So the other problem with reherniation is, is once you have a reherniation, those patients typically do worse, they're not as satisfied with their outcome, they have a higher chance of using opiates, and they have, a, they have a decreased chance of really returning back to gainful employment. Now, this is kind of a different type of device. We've seen devices that are really based on the annulus, a suture around the annulus, or something that tries to reattach the annulus. This kind of leaves the annular defect intact, this is really more of a barricade that's placed inside the annulus and is really based on the end plate. So I think if you really see that MRI on the right side is the problematic patient, okay? When I see an MRI like that, I'm like, oh gosh, okay, I know I can take care of the disc herniation, but in the back of my mind, I always ask, how much disc do I need to take? And then when I'm in surgery, I'm like, okay, do I need to take more? Do I take less? Do I just do a bumpectomy or I do a total tub, subtotal discectomy? That to me, I think, is the difficulty with disc herniations. So the barricade actually is a device. It's actually already FDA approved. They ran a 500 patient study, OUS, and I'll show you some of those results. Now, if you look at the device, this is what it looks like. So it's implanted in the end plate. So it's anchored into the end plate. And then there's a flap that's deployed that remains in the annulus, deep in the annulus. And all it tries to do is, it doesn't try to close the annulus. What it tries to do is barricade recurrent disc herniations. So it's, it's indicated for large annular tear. So it has to be greater than six millimeters or equal to greater than six millimeters. It comes in two sizes. And this is the technique. You do a bumpectomy, okay? And if you have a large annular tear, you basically deploy this device, but instead of closing the annulus as your mechanism of action, what you do is, is you anchor it into the end plate and use the flap as a barricade. So they ran a level one randomized prospective study. Now what's unique about the study is it's a superiority study, because it has to be. You know, you can't be equivalent to your standard disc herniations. You have to be superior. And due to that fact, you have to have large numbers. So this study is 554 patients across 21 sites into one-to-one -one randomization. So if you look at the inclusion criteria, it's pretty standard, L1 to S1. Um, the age are 21 to 75. They basically excluded less than grade two or more than grade two spondylolisthesis and obvious, for obvious reasons. The evaluation, I think what's unique about the evaluation, they evaluate these very closely with annual MRIs out to five years. So all these patients got annual MRIs to five years to basically look at recurrent herniations as well as other imaging modalities. And this is the study design. So it was 647 patients that were consented. 93 had interop screen failures, basically because the annulus, the tear in the annulus was not large enough. So it's really indicated for tears that are six millimeters or greater. And then 555 patients or 554 patients were the intent to treat arm. And then those got randomized to either control or a placement of an annular closure device. 
And you can see at least to two years of follow-up compliance was 92%. So very good follow-up compliance. And these are the results, I'm sorry, these are the demographics. You can see the demographics, I think what's interesting, it's about 40 years of age. I think that's what we see in our population in the United States. It's predominantly more male than female. And predominant disc levels are L4-5 and L5-S1, obviously the most common, two most common levels where we see disc herniations. So this is what you see from an MRI. So when you follow patients with MRIs annually, you can actually get a recurrence rate, okay? And so this is the difference. It's about a 50% reduction. So just recurrence rate. Now these patients are those that have very large annular defects, like the MRI that I showed, the problematic patients. The recurrence rate by MRI was 30% in the control group, okay, very, very high, and about 15% in those patients who receive this annular closure device, so a reduction of about 50%. Now, if you looked at it now, obviously all those are not symptomatic. But if you look at the reoperations for symptoms, it's again a 50% reduction from 20% to 11%. And then if you look at who got the repeat discectomy, you can see the differential in procedures. So 41 in the control group got repeat discectomies at the index level, and only 14 with the annual closure device. So this is a level one data that demonstrates the effectiveness of the annular closure device. It did show superiority. Risk of re, um, reoperation was decreased from 19% to 11%. And there were probably there were really equal complication and adverse events in both groups. So these are patients with reoperation for ear herniation. This is now going out to uh, three years. But what's interesting is you can see this graph. And so the reoperations in the control group, so those patients that didn't get an annular closure device, you can see the slope. So typically those happens within the first six months. So when you need a reoperation, they typically tend to happen within the first six months. So this is what the indication is. It's high risk patients with large annular defects. Um, it decreases symptomatic reherniations by 50%, index level reoperations by 43% and reoperation for reherniation is by 60%. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say that this closure device is out in the booth. You can take a look at it. Um, I think it's very unique and different than the ones we've seen before that are based on the annulus. It's really based on the end plate. And uh, I think the data is very compelling. Thank you very much. Uh, are we done? Okay. We're done. Okay. So, I think now, because I want to give our deformity colleagues their due time, does anybody have a, a question, like one quick question? How long does it take to put in the barricade? So the barricade, I, I've never done it myself, and I, I'm sure they have an example, but it seems like it would take more than about, I don't think it would take more than five or ten minutes. Uh, for both devices you presented, for removal, so can you take out the, those cannulated pedicles, screw? Uh, if you have to fuse the patient that develops a spondy, for example, without destroying the pedicle? Yes. So I don't know these for sure, but I know that there have been removal. You can take that out, and the pedicle is still intact. It does heal. It takes about six months for it to heal, though. So you, you kind of want to make, make sure you have that window. Yeah. And then for the barricade device, if five years later that patient needs an ADR, do I have to go in the back and take it out? I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I would assume that, I don't know if you could take an anterior grade. It seems like you would have to remove that, but that, I'm sure we could ask that question to the company itself. Vin. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, on one of your graphs, the, the number of patients that needed a fusion was the same in both groups. That's right. Wow, you paid attention. Um, so what do you think in the long run? I know your, your follow-up isn't that long. Do you yeah, think? I think, when I look at that, I, I think that that may be due a different entity, because the study, the study cutoff was grade two spondies. So what I feel that there were some patients that had the discectomy in probably a high grade spondy. You know what I'm saying? And, and whether you get a barricade or not, you're probably fusing the patient for other reasons than just a recurrent herniation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Chris, you have a question? Okay. You just said one, uh, one question on the pedicle lengthening. I, I, as I listen to this, and I've seen this technology around, it, it must have been around for more than 10 years, it seems like. 
uh, trickling around different it's a labor of love for Greg, industry yeah. partners, right? <laughs> to me, I, the question in my mind is, is it a solution without a problem? Um, many of our decompression patients are among, do the best among all of our, all of the uh, subgroups of the populations that we treat. And it's, it strikes me that once this is scaled and goes out to the general spine surgical population, we're going to see more and more issues with malplacement, with, I know the, the reported healing rate was 100%, but I find that a little bit difficult to believe, and pedicle fracture, instability, when previously with decompression, especially minimally invasive decompression, we didn't see those sorts of problems uh, so much. Um, yeah, no, I, what I is think... Your comment on it being a solution without a problem. Yeah, no, I think point well taken for sure. Um, you know, if you look at kind of what, what else is out there for this besides an open decompression, which is probably the cheapest and functionally maybe the best, um, I think that uh, there have been a lot of solutions like that, right? Interspinous spacers, vertiflex, coflex, you know, so the list goes on. So, I, I mean, I don't know how to answer that question, but besides, you know, I like this technology. It, it seems like it's very innovative, and um, if we can get over that kind of the cost hurdle, um, I think it's it's I, I think it's put it more direct than doing like a vertiflex. Does that make sense? It's like it makes so much more sense to me. Pat, can I? I, I, pre I appreciate Chris's comments about that. Is that something like that? Once it gets out there. It's done in perfection by the guys that are doing the studies and things like that. But on the other hand, I've had a four-level lumbar decompression, okay? So I would sign up for this, potentially. Uh, also, the, the patients that have these degen spondies that you look at and say, gee, if they just had more room in there, and I go in and do an interlaminar decompression, take out the ligament, things like that, those are destabilizing procedures. So. I look at there's a whole bunch of people that you can buy them time. And once again, uh, I'm quoting Ed Dawson, who lots of people know in the room, we don't cure spine problems, we treat them. And if this one kicks the can down the road some years, two to five to ten years, you know, for those kind of patients, I think it's beautiful technology. But Why? it has to be done by safety. That's the whole thing. Chris yeah. is absolutely, absolutely right. Safety you know, is the biggest I, issue. I think the other thing with this Incredible. technology, if, if we're talking about the pedicle lengthening osteotomy, is, is the idea of treating spondees that have stenosis, decompressing them, which is their primary problem, mm -hmm. and hopefully having an alternative for those patients who then go on to fusion. Does that make sense? So if you can treat it, give them more canal space without increasing the instability, you know, that may be the cost differential that we need to see. But before closing, I just want to recognize um, Dan Shuba and Armin, both of these are my colleagues. Um, Dan is from Hopkins. He's a professor of neurosurgery. He's going to be uh, the leader of the breakout. You should really see this Augmetics technology. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and then... Congratulations to you, Bank. Great session. This oh, is thank a you. neat thank session. You. And all the speakers, Dan, Armin, great stuff. Really love it. Thank you. I'm going to give these guys a round of applause.